So good morning. Good morning. Uh, there was a little uh, discussion and, uh, about what happens at uh, American centers. And, uh, the vast majority of American Buddhist centers are uh, of the Japanese tradition. So if you go looking for some place to visit, that's what you're going to visit is, is a center there. And uh, there was brought up this phenomenon. We were having a discussion a couple of days ago uh, that uh, there's an awful lot of politics going on. I guess that'd be the simplest way to say it. And, uh, and of course, I've seen this in that uh, everybody's looking for, how do we say it nicely? I don't know how we say it nicely. They're looking for their title. They're looking for their power structure. They're looking for how they can be in charge of something. And um, it made me think, we had a fellow here many years ago who uh, lived locally. He still lives in the valley, but he doesn't live in Lucerne Valley. And uh, he'd been doing meditation for many years at different places. And he was having really having a lot of difficulty with this meditation. And that's primarily what we're about here. We're about talking. There's only one reason I give a talk on Sunday or I have going on with people in the past. Sandy, what is the reason that I give a talk on Sunday? Because we want it. I didn't hear what you said. Because we want it. That's exactly right. Yeah, because I found it, it uh, it's kind of like putting honey out for the bees and they will come. Because um, for many years, you know, when I first put the robe on, I never gave talks, even though anybody that knows me knows that I just love the sound of my own voice. But I didn't give any talks because I really didn't have anything to talk about. Um, and so one day, this fellow was here, and uh, he was very active here. He uh, took on certain responsibilities like maintaining the fish pond and, and stuff like that. And uh, he had sent me an email. We came up on the summer, and we used to do the summer training during the summer. And uh, so I had encouraged everybody to increase their meditation or their reading of sutras or whatever it was that they did uh, to, to make a little bit of extra effort during the summertime. And uh, so he said, well, you know, I used to keep a diary. I was at this place. I kept a diary. And could I email you that diary? And up until then, I didn't realize that he was a very lonely man. And uh, if he watches this, I hope he doesn't take offense that I'm not distorting anything. Because I realized, whoa, he might actually, he might actually listen to the talks or, or something, and I don't know. Haven't seen him in a very, very long time. Um, and uh, but he was very lonely, and he told me he was lonely. That wasn't me and my magical gift. That was him telling me that he was really, really lonely, and he didn't really have any friends here. And so I, I, what it turned out to be is that he went to work and worked very hard and went home and spent a lot of time on the computer, kind of like some people spend a lot of time in front of the TV with a can of beer, you know, same sort of thing. And so he started saying, he says, could I send you my diary? And I said, sure. I had no idea what to do with this diary, you know. And uh, he started sending me the diary. And the first thing I found out is that I had thought that with years and years and years of meditation, and we're talking a fella that had, I don't know, it was never quantified, but 12, 14 years of meditation, a long time, that uh, his meditation would be, oh, I don't know, what, mature? accomplished, comfortable, he could do it without, you know, having a lot of turmoil. And I found out that he could he could pull off about 20 minutes and then he just was in, in trouble. He just really couldn't sit down. And then I found out later that he, he always talked about wanting to have long retreats here, but I found out that the place he went to before, I became friends with the abbot there, that he would usually leave about halfway through the retreat, that it would just be too much for him to do. So, but I didn't know all of that. And uh, he said to me, he says, you know, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. 
I, w I want to do something more. And for the first and only time, I said to someone, why don't you become a monk? I had never said that before, and I've never said that since. Anybody you ever see put on the robe around here and cut their hair, that is, they came to me and said, I would like to become a monk. And so, but I said that to him. I said, why don't you think about becoming a monk? And I think it was because he had so many years of practice, and he had come up against the wall, and he couldn't seem to get around that wall. And I've never forgot his remark. Oh, become a teacher. Oh, I couldn't become a teacher. And, and that was the end of our discussion. But it, it stuck with me because I realized for the first time that at least one American looked at becoming a monk as becoming the teacher. And when he said the, it had a capital T on it. And, and I started looking at what was going on in American centers. And I became aware of the fact that there was an idea that once you uh, cut your hair off, which is, is the beginning of becoming a monk, uh, the, the Buddha did it to get rid of his caste. The Buddha was a high caste Indian, and when he cut his hair off, he had no caste. And uh, that's what the holy men in India do today. They'll cut their hair off, they have no caste. And uh, so you could say that after the Buddha's time, we get rid of our social standing by cutting our hair off. Uh, because it tells so much about who we are. And, um, and I realized, I started looking and I realized that there was this kind of, I, I think of the, the, the little animal, what is it? Uh, hamster. Hamster going on the wheel. And, and this whole Japanese thing, you, anytime I'm talking about Buddhism and Japanese come up, I go, and they're different. Everybody else does it this way and, and they're different, which they are. The Japanese do things uniquely their own way. And uh, most of it, there's very little precedence in the rest of the Buddhist world. And so they have all these levels. I think of it uh, as I said something the other day to somebody, oh, no, you don't. Know, oh, yeah, you do. You know, you get a white belt, and you get a yellow belt, and then you get an orange belt, and then you get a purple belt, and then you get a brown belt, and then somewhere along the line, you get a black belt. That's Roshi. Okay? <laughs> and and, and they, go, they go through all these little levels. And... Um, they become important. The ob object becomes the level rather than the practice. And in the beginning, of course, Japanese Buddhism was not that way. Uh, there really are only two levels of ordination, although my teacher, my Japanese teacher, used to say, well, there's seven levels. And I, I think Americans have made it about 14 or 18. I, can't, I don't know what the Americans are doing. They have Dharma holders and precept givers and and I don't know what any of those things mean, you know. Um, and they're just endless. You can find it out on the internet. You, you look up this stuff and they just have all of these different friggin' titles. And what are they doing with all these titles? We have two titles. We have beginning monk and monk. <laughs> That's it. Okay. And, uh, you know, those two, they're monks now. Last year they were novices. They were beginning monks. That's it. There's no place. There's no more ordinations for them. If they're really good and keep their nose clean, at some point I'll elevate them and give them a title. But it's not an ordination. You know, they'll become tantwa. They'll become great master. And then, uh, then their work will really begin. And they don't even know that now. But then the work really begins because they're expected to train monks. That's exactly what's expected to happen. So I thought about that and I started looking and I thought, God, what a lousy system that, that you're constantly grasping for something. You're constantly moving towards some sort of title or some sort of empowerment. Of course, the Tibetans, oh my God, you know, they have endless empowerments. We'll give you all of these and when you're done with those and we'll give you all of these and then when, when you're really ready, we'll give you all of these. And what can possibly be going through their mind with all that stuff? All my life I've heard, because all my life I've been a Buddhist, I've heard that Buddhism is for some people, not everyone. Buddhism is not a religion. I had my doctor tell me that. 
not my current doctor. My current doctor is a Buddhist. He would take great offense to that. But it's okay because it's not a religion. I went, oh, okay. So what is it? Well, it's it's a philosophy. Okay. And uh, I read philosophy. When I was young, I thought maybe I'd, when I went to college, I had fantasies. Nobody had ever gone to college in my family. And so I had fantasies about college. So I, I fulfilled those fantasies when I turned 18. I went into the Army. Yeah, well, it was almost the same thing. And uh, I started reading philosophy. I read about philosophers. That was fun. That's history. I would have made a great historian. I would have made a lousy philosopher. Because when I got into college and I started taking philosophy, I went, whoa, I don't like this stuff. This stuff stinks. Really? If all of A is B and B is part of C and Q is part of 9, and then therefore, and I'm going, who cares? <laughs> who came up with this? But it's a philosophy. Okay. I, I looked at philosophies, and one of the things I discovered about philosophies when I was young is that, first of all, nobody lives a philosophy. It's their idea of what life is like. Or it's their idea of what life should be like. I think Kant really felt that this is the way things should be. All right, is that Buddhism? Well, no, the Buddha didn't talk about, he wasn't, well, he did describe what life was like. But that's not Buddhism. Buddhism is overcoming what life is like. Okay, so that doesn't work. And it's not, Buddhism is not what life should be. Because life is perfectly fine just the way it is. Our problem is that we don't accept that. Our problem is that we want life to be different than it is. Okay, the last couple of days I've had way too much soda. I have been so hot, and it's been so humid. And there's been no one around to pull the rain in on me. If Rob was there, I would have been going, well, I guess I better have a big glass of water, because <laughs> Rob is so good about that stuff. And I went in and got, I think I'll have a second orange crush. There's nobody to see me doing this at lunchtime, you know? And I went to Orange Crush because a second Coca-Cola, ooh, ooh, I get all wired up. Somebody brought me a Coke. You will watch me drink a Coke while you drink water today. <laughs> somebody brought me a Coke. Um, so that philosophy thing, I, I just had a lot of difficulty with that. And it's kind of, for the point of this talk, it's kind of important that we define what we're, we're doing. And then other people said, well, it's a way of life. Well, I like that better. It's not a religion, it's a way of life. Okay, I understand way of life. Because that's what you do. Now here's my question to you. If Buddhism is what we do, why aren't other religions what we do? Remember the criticism? See, I grew up hearing this all the time, but I wasn't inside, I was outside. Well, they come to church on Sunday and they're really, really good, but on Monday they're not so good. And of course, the old argument about the Catholic. You know, and, and I, I have a mental image of a Catholic, which I have a very positive image of Catholics. But the mental image I have is the Irish Catholic who works 14 hours. And on Friday he gets paid and he goes and gets drunk. And you know why he gets drunk? Because his whole friggin' body hurts. He works so hard and he needs some kind of release. So he gets drunk. Unfortunately, all inhibitions go away. And he goes home and he's so angry at the world and he's angry at the job he has to do, which he hates with a passion, and he starts hitting his wife. So we have this stereotype, which of course not all Catholics did that, but we have a really negative stereotype of the Catholic man as a hard-working, hard-drinking wife beater. <laughs> wow, that, that's a big argument for becoming Catholic right there. And then he sobers up, and as we know about violent people, he's so sorry the next day. And he apologizes, and he does everything that wife beaters do. And he goes to church on Sunday morning, and he apologizes to God, because he goes into the confession. And you know, 
Protestants really misunderstand confession. Confession is about really being sorry for what you do. It's not about getting away with anything. If you're a good Catholic, when you go in and say, God, I'm sorry that I beat my wife, you really have to be sorry. The problem is there's a cycle of violence, which I'm not going to go in. Because I think we live in an enlightened age, and you've probably read articles in your men or women's magazines about this. But it's a cycle that has to be broken. And somebody has to step in there and break that cycle of violence. Okay? But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about that that Catholic, when he goes in and confesses, he's really sorry. And then he goes through another six days of hell. And he gets to the end of it. And maybe that week he doesn't beat up on his wife, he beats up on the guy next to him in the bar. But the long and the short of it is, that's not really living his religion, is it? And we talk about, you know, the guys that act one way in church and act another way in, in society. That's what I'm talking about here. And of course, Protestants are just as guilty. They beat their wives just as much because half of Ireland is Protestant. And don't ever forget that. The only thing the Protestants don't have is the confessional. Yes, they do. You thought, did anybody correct me there? What kind of Protestants in Catholic Catholicism or in, in Ireland? Anglicans. Huh? Anglican Church. That's right. And they have confessional. It's voluntary, but they have the confessional. Do you know that I was well into old age when I discovered that the Catholics who were killing each other were the Anglicans and the Catholics, and to me that's the same thing. <laughs> it's English Catholics and then it's Roman Catholics. That's what's in my mind. And when I found that out, I thought, what in the world is going on? It has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with politics. But if you wear a red coat all the time, I know who you are. If you wear a black coat all the time, I know who you are. It's politics. So we come back to Buddhism. What is the point of it? And why do people go to practice? And so I asked Hui Meng this morning, I said, what do you want me to talk about? Yeah, because I give a lot of thought to this talk stuff. And he says, you know, we were talking about how people act in centers. And I go, yeah, that's a good thing to talk about. Okay, Dogen, who started this whole Soto thing, and that's primarily what American Buddhism is, Soto Zen Buddhism. Yeah, there's a couple of Rinzai places. And Yan Han has two or three, well, he has two or three hundred little groups that sit and listen to his tape recording. But there's no monks involved in it. And they sit around and go, isn't he wonderful? So we, we have a kind of a cult worship thing going on there. But primarily we have Soto Zen. And the founder of Soto Zen, who by the way was forgotten until about a hundred years ago, they completely forgot him. They forgot all his writings, they forgot his teachings. You know, he was this guy in the, in the distant past that went to China, came back, started a monastery out in the middle of nowhere. Much worse than this place. Just out in the middle of nothing. <laughs> okay? And it's still in the middle of nothing. And, and then another guy came along named Kazan, and he started a monastery right in the middle of Yokohama. And you all know about that because we have naval bases in Yokohama. And he, that's, that's huge. The largest meditation hall in the world is in Sojiji. And Dogen said, one minute of meditation of Zazen is one minute of enlightenment. What is the point of Buddhism? This is what I'm working up to. What is the point? Is it to have a good philosophy that you can sit around, have a glass of mulled wine, and talk to your friends about that's pretty useless, isn't it? Is it a collection of superstitions that you can follow? And then maybe if you're really, really good, when you die, everything will be good? Or, or you can, you know, and people have heard me yammer on about this. I don't know that it's ever been on the internet. But my, my personal opinion of Christian heaven is hell. There's no puppy dogs, there's no trees, there's no birds, there's no grass, there's no music. There's no other people. You get to live in a room all by yourself. That's Foursquare. In Foursquare you have your own mansion, which is basically a big room. 
That's what I want to do is die and be alone for the rest of eternity. Oh, I know. There's this God thing over there, and that's going to make me feel good. But the reality is you're alone. We had a puppy dog when I was little, and it died, and I said to my mother, is it going to go to heaven? And she said no, because she'd been raised by nuns. And she says a puppy dog doesn't have a soul, and only things that have a soul go to heaven. I want you to think about that just briefly. Only things that have a soul go to heaven. That's where you want to live forever and ever and ever? Really? Now, karma and rebirth, I mean, you know, people think, well, that's really bad. You could come back as a bug. I'd much rather be a bug and have other bugs around me than be alone forever and ever and ever. Really. So why do people go to a center? Well, the meditation centers, Americans, I keep telling the Vietnamese, Americans love meditation. Most of the Vietnamese temples are Pure Land temples, which means that they read sutras and they recite sutras and they chant sutras. And they have a notion. And the notion is that it is so very difficult to become absolutely 100% pure that we have to wait until the next birth. Because we just can't pull it off in this birth. How many of you are absolutely pure? My hand is not up, by the way. <laughs> I was just encouraging you. Okay, so that means you're not going to be reborn as a Buddha. That is the pure land per perception of what's going on. And there is a new a movement in Vietnam that I heard about a couple months ago when I was in Las Vegas at a temple. Okay, I was not gambling. I don't gamble. I found out very early age that I lost the Snickers bar and there was no way to get it back. <laughs> Gambling doesn't really work. So I was in Las Vegas at this small temple uh, and I was informed by a person there that there's a new thing going on in Vietnam. And it's very much like the Jogo Shin in Japan, where all you have to do is recite the name of the Buddha and you will be reborn in the Pure Land. And because you're reborn in the Pure Land, you will be, the next time you die, you will be enlightened. And you will be a Buddha. And ain't that wonderful? And you don't have to do a thing except say the Buddha's name. So you can grab a 30 out 6 go out and start shooting people. And as long as you say the Buddha's name, everything's fine. There is no personal responsibility for your actions. And I can't buy it. At the very least, you should learn to be nice to each other. That's basic Buddhism. Learning to be nice to each other. A little bit better than learning to be nice to each other is learning to take care of each other. Where do I get that from? I mean, that's pretty astounding stuff, huh? Well, how about looking at the life of the Buddha? He did not do what religious leaders did in his time, 2,500 years ago. If you became awakened, or people thought you were awakened, you sat under a tree and just died. You just sat there and died. And I know you go, how could anybody do that? Well, they're ascetics. I heard a heart, <sighs> what do you say? Not rendering. It's like somebody reached out and grabbed my heart and squeezed it on the news. What would, what would wrenching. You wrenching, heart wrenching, think. That's our lawyer. She's got a good vocabulary. I heard this extraordinary thing on the, on the radio, and I just caught it. It's just almost like subconsciously. I was driving the truck, and there was a couple. I have to share this with you because it's just so phenomenal. Because you, people say things like that don't ever happen. There was a couple that they had to come from a different country because they married at the age of eight. And they were together for 75 years. And the husband was dying of cancer. And the wife said, I'm going to have a hard time getting through this. She said, I want to be held by him when he dies. And so she got in bed with him. And he died. And she turned to her children and said, OK, 
okay, I'm going now. She, she needs me. And within one hour, she died. Okay. So you hear stories about things like that. They do really happen. They live their life for each other. This is the perfect model of the Buddha's life. The Buddha, instead of saying, I'll just, I'm, I've got the answer, I understand. What he understood was the nature of life. And he understood how he fit in life. And he understood why people were unhappy. And he stopped being unhappy. And everybody else, probably lots of people understood that. But they just sat under the tree and said, okay, I've accomplished it. I've run my race and I won the race, and now I'll sit here and just die. And we have a story of him being tempted by Mara, the temptress who comes along. The image is a beautiful woman, because, you know, women cause all problems. I say, I say this only for Mary. Women cause all problems. And so she came and she said, oh, you could be anything. You could, you could run the world. You could have all these beautiful women. And can't you imagine, Rob, you're sitting there and you see all these beautiful women in your mind and you're thinking to yourself, I could have all of this? You don't even need Mara to make that happen. <laughs> yeah, you got all these beautiful women. And she said, you can have all of this. And the Buddha decided not to. The Buddha decided to teach, not to sit there and, and die, but to go out and teach. And for 45 years, he taught people how to be happy. That's all Buddhism is. It's a religion of how to be happy. It's not a religion of how to be scared. It's not a religion of how to be guilty. It's not a religion of how to earn your way into eternal bliss. It's a religion of how to be happy right now. And the Buddha said it very simply. He said, we, we're attached to things and we desire things. And though that's what causes us to be unhappy. Susan knows that if there's no Coca-Cola in my refrigerator, and I open that refrigerator, I'm in trouble. What she doesn't know is I've converted to Dr. Pepper. <laughs> but I still have Coca-Cola around. I got hooked on Dr. Pepper at the deli. <laughs> but it's not a complicated, it's not a, a catastrophic thing. The Buddha was not talking about catastrophic events. He wasn't talking about you lose your house or your car is destroyed. He was talking about every day is filled with discontent. The word he used was dukkha, and dukkha means discontent. It does not mean suffering. Okay, it's Buddhists in this country constantly say the Buddha uh, came up with a solution to suffering. No, he didn't. He came up with a, the, the solution to discontent with life. And suffering just a piece of it. Everybody suffers. The Buddha did not say, if you walk out in the dark, the other night, I got a purple toe. It's almost back to normal. I got up to go to the bathroom, and I ran my toe right into a table leg. And I've done this more than once. And I knew exactly what I would see the next day. The Buddha did not say, if you follow my teachings, you won't run your toe into a table leg. He didn't say that, the, you know, and it was purple for about a week. Now it's kind of yellowish. He didn't say that that would stop. He said that you would accept the fact that if you run your toe into a table leg, it will turn purple. That's what he taught. He taught that if you love someone, the Buddha never taught not to love. Okay, we have two models of Buddhism. We have what I call the vegetable or the big potato who's doing meditation. It has absolutely no emotions at all. Isn't that who you want to be? There are Indian ascetics and holy men that is the goal of their life, is to kill all desire of any kind, all emotion of any kind, and attachment. When the Buddha talked about attachment, he didn't say that you wouldn't like your cat. He didn't say that. Because if you don't care about your cat, you'll let him starve to death, right? If you don't care about the neighbor kid, you just let him get run over by the car. He never said that. He said, what you'll do is you won't suffer when stuff happens because you'll accept the fact that life is full of change, 
that nothing stays constant, that things are always happening. We're going to get sick, we're going to get old, and we're going to die. And everybody else is too. And if we can accept those things, then we're going to be okay. But it doesn't mean that when <laughs> I yelled, <laughs> you probably heard me. That's when you woke up a little bit and you rolled over and went back to sleep when I nailed that toe. Remember a few years ago when I had my eyes? I, I did that like six times to both feet because I couldn't, I couldn't see where things were. I had my eyes operated on. They cut the muscles in both eyes. And so everything was like a big blur. And uh, I really wanted to get a cane and just start doing that. So people go to sinners, and they go to sinners to be somebody. And therein is the paradox. We come back to that. They go to sinners so they'll be the guy that hits the drum. They go to sinners so they'll be the guy that tells you where to sit. I had a student who went to the New York Zen Center, one of the oldest centers. Suzuki was on the board. D.T. Suzuki was on the board of that center. It's in a brownstone. She came back and says, I'll never go to any place like that again. They told her how to walk through the door. They were standing there. They told her how, to, how many steps to take, how to do this, how to do that. A lot of the Japanese centers are that way. They think that stuff's important. But somebody has to tell you, so somebody has some power, okay? And Buddhism is learning about not having power. It's learning about not having to be something. Because I'm always here, at least for a while, to remind you that you're already somebody. You already have. Look at Sandy. This is Sandy's daughter. This is the first time she, isn't she beautiful? Look at the power Sandy has. Okay, that's our little Sandy who's so, so uh, humble, but all this tremendous power. You have tremendous power already over the people around you. You don't have to go get anything. You don't need titles. You don't need badges. You know, you don't need any of that stuff. You've already got it. So why do you come to the center? Well, to do meditation. Why do you do meditation? Because you need to meet somebody. There's somebody important that you need to meet. Okay, the trap has started doing meditation. You know, I probably, I probably haven't told the story in a real long time. There's a monk named Sasaki Roshi. Sasaki Roshi is like the oldest monk in the universe right now. He's like, what is he, 108 or 9 or something? He passed away. Oh, he passed away? Yeah. When did he pass away? In 2014. What? <laughs> and we didn't even do a ceremony for him? Anyway, he was he was a real character. Okay? Kind of like this one right here. Okay, Sasaki was like the, the, the unpredictable man. And they gave him a special title because he was the oldest, oldest monk in his tradition. So they, they I think they made it up. It probably in Japanese it meant oldest monk in our tradition. And there's probably a really good reason why I'm talking about it, but I just did my oldest monk. <laughs> Um, and if you're uh, a little bit skittish about reading about Buddhism, read about Buddhism and Catholicism, because Merton was a wonderful Trappist monk who brought Buddhist monks into his monastery to teach the monks how to meditate. And I've always felt, I've read a lot of the mystics from the Middle Ages, the one thing they didn't have was meditation. They had everything else. They knew how to starve themselves to death. You know, they'd get that rope. Did you see that movie? You know, like this. They're beating themselves and everything. Yeah, they could do all that stuff. Uh, but they, their, their meditation was horrible. They'd get down on their knees. Can you imagine? They probably couldn't walk by the time they were 40. They'd spend hours on their knees on a hard plank. Not, not like in the Catholic Church where they put a little cushion there. This is just a hard plank. So Merton brought in Zen masters. Sasaki goes in to the Trappist Monastery up in Northern and a monk comes in, and the thing we do in Zen that makes us, one of the things that makes us a little different, is when we do meditation retreats, we have interviews. And you're supposed to go in and talk to the teacher, even if you don't want to. Okay? By, by uh, <laughs> you're supposed to force yourself to do it. Because perhaps the teacher can poke you with a stick and 
get you to look at the most important person you'll ever meet in your life. And I know you think that's God. So this Trappist monk came in and he started talking to Sasaki and he said, you know, I'm just, I can't concentrate. My mind is everywhere. Welcome to the world of meditation. My mind won't settle down, all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and Sasaki said, so, so what is it that you're thinking of? He says, I'm thinking of God. He says, oh, well, you just try hard enough and God will disappear. The monk got real upset. He said, no, 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 that can't happen. No, 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 no. He says, no, the, 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 the God can't disappear. I should disappear. And Sasaki said, there is no difference whether it's you or God disappears. Okay. So that's why the Catholics were in trouble with their meditation. They thought there was something they were supposed to think about rather than just being quiet. So who do you meet in the meditation hall, Susan? Susan meets Susan. Nobody else. Susan begins to understand Susan, and in understanding herself, she understands everybody else. Every fault you have is shared by everybody else in this room. Every good quality that you have is shared by everybody in this room. Okay? If nothing else, it's genetically proven. Okay? You know Bill Nye, the, the science guy? Somebody sent me a thing, and there's Bill and I, the science guy, and he said just what I said. You've heard me say this before. Everybody is related to everybody. He went one step further. He said there is no such thing as race. Race is a construction because somebody lived in a place where their skin got darker or their hair got lighter. He said genetically, everybody is the same as everybody else. And the Buddha knew that because the Buddha said, because that whole issue of race was there 2,500 years ago. He said, everybody has salty tears, and everybody, when you cut them, bleeds red. Same thing. So why do we go to a meditation center? It's not to go to heaven. It's not to be powerful. It certainly should not be to be some sort of teacher, whatever that means. It's to encourage other people. And it's to be encouraged. And that's the whole point of Buddhism, is to encourage other people and to be encouraged. Who will ring the bell? I didn't ring the bell at the start.